This week, let's talk about something basic, fundamental, that we always forget, but it is extremely important. And uh, it's good for the for beginners, for first time comer. Something this something that 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 would give answers to questions like, where did we, uh, why did we get born into this world? Where did we come from? Who am I? How come everybody's circumstances uh, of life are different? How come uh, some people are poor, some people are rich, some people are healthy, some people are unhealthy, some people have good family, some people have broken homes, some people have a uh, happy childhood, and some people have abusive childhood. How come all these differences? How come, how come, um, uh, how come we are born uh, and experience uh, the, the, uh, the vicissitude of life uh, of everybody is it's different? All changeability, all change. What, what happened? Um, why do we have these inequalities? Is it because some creator uh, uh, destined to what we should do and what we can do and what we can experience? Well, let's bring up the, uh, a very fundamental concept of what the Buddha talked about to explain all this. And that word is karma. So the subject of today's talk is karma. K-A-R-M-A. -A. And, and if you don't know the, the concept of karma, there's a lot of things you can't explain. Where do I come from? How did I get born? Why do I have to take the trouble of being born, going through the vicissitude of life that I have experienced, and then finally I have to, I have to go, finally. Finally, my apartment is due, my body apartment, this lease agreement is due and I got to leave. What's all this trouble? Why take the trouble of coming and going? Have you ever thought of that? Or you don't really care since everybody's going through the same thing? We, we get born, we become sick, we get old, and finally we die. And that we accept it? You accept everything for granted? The Buddha didn't accept it. The Buddha said, what's the mystery of life? How come we have to go through all this? It's always the, it's always the, um, that further step that you think about that leads you to something that requires wisdom to go through. Do you have that wisdom? What is karma? And it's a Sanskrit word, K-A-R-M-A. Literally, it means an accumulation of our deeds, words, and thoughts. Deeds, words, and thoughts. That's you. That's your volitional, volitional actions. What else? Deeds, what are deeds? Your behavior, what you have done, what you're doing. What are, what are your words? Your language, your speech. That's how you communicate with others. What are your thoughts? Your mind. That embraces everything about you. Anything else? That's what you think, what you talk about, and what you do. All these things, or simply put, karma is our volitional actions. Where there is consciousness, there is karma. You agree? Do you have consciousness? Where there's consciousness, there's karma. If you don't have consciousness, you don't have karma. A piece of do stone, a piece of stone is non-sentient being. There's no consciousness. Plans do not accumulate karma, nor is any action which is unintentional a karma, because karma depends on your volition as well as will. The nature of every action from the perspective of morality can be classified as in three ways. From the perspective of morality, the nature of every action, every thought, every speech can be classified as virtuous, non-virtuous, and neutral, or good, bad, or neutral. It's either good or bad, or neither good nor bad. Whatever you've done, you may be always doing the bad thing, always doing the good thing, or a mixture, or neutral. But according to sutras, 
all sentient beings are going through samsara since the beginning of time, the unending cycle of birth and rebirth. We'll live in time and space. You see, sometimes I think we, an individual, as a puny little individual, with very restricted time and space, but we'll live in the vastness of time and space. How restricted we are in, in, in time. What have you got? You got a hundred years? Hundred years is, is, is a boat, is a, is a flash of lightning in the vastness of time. So this puny little individual with limited time and space is living in the vastness of time and space. Isn't it something we should think about? What is time and space? What is time? You analyze the universe, you analyze yourself. You analyze what is surrounding you. What is time? Time is the past, the present, and the future. Or is vertically, we call it the vertical perspective. You got a, you got a, you got a, you got a past, past, present, and the future. And it, this three dimensions is characterized by day and night. Spring, autumn, summer, winter, time changes, changeability of time. What is space? Space is, 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 is existence. What exists in space? Existence, characterized by birth and rebirth of sentient beings and their rising, abiding, changing, and disintegrating of non sentient beings. What are non sentient beings? Non-sentient being is beings that have no feelings, no, no emotional feelings, no passion. Stone, plant, even plant is living being, but it's not as emotional as the human being. So we live in time and space. And, and then we should pause and think about, oh, we'll, we are a puny little individual with restricted, limited time living in the vastness of space and, and, and time. Uh, what is my time? My time? What is my past? What is my present? Mm -hmm. What about my future? You know, you have more than this life, you know. You have many, many past lives. You have your present life. And if you don't get enlightened and attain nirvana in this life, you can't get out of samsara in this life, you're going to have a next life. You reincarnate into a next life. Many, many lives before. Do you realize it? Some people say, when I die, nothing left. You mean when you die, nothing got left? You know what you're left with when you die? When you die, you're not left with anything. Not your jewelry box, not your bank account. Not your apartment, not your house, nothing. But what have you got left with when you died? Karma. You got left with that invisible, latent energy of karma. And some people, especially beginners of, of, of philosophy, like to ask, where does karma come from? Where does karma come from? To such uh, a question from a beginner, I would counter question. I don't usually give an answer to it. I said, where does wind come from? Where does fire come from? Where does wind, you know where does wind come from? We know there's wind. We don't know where it comes from. We know there's fire. We don't know where fire comes from. You light a match, you light a, li a, a lighter, and it, you get it. But where does it come from? That's, of course, a very glib answer for a profound question. We'll, we have to talk more about it anyway. Where does karma come from? Have you ever thought of where does wind come from? You can't get an answer. Where does wind come from? <laughs> In the Chinese language, Feng chong lao li lai. Ni jidao feng chong lao li lai ma? Bu jidao. Huo chong lao li lai? Bu jidao. Where does fire come from? We don't know. You think fire comes from the lighter? 
If fire comes from the lighter, that lighter will explode. Fire is in there. You understand what I mean? So, we've gone through reincarnations, we call it. What is reincarnation? Reincarnation is the passing away from one body to be reborn in another body. Like a light bulb. You see a light bulb? That light bulb there, it's bound to be replaced. It's destined to be replaced one day. Another bulb will replace it. It changes form, constantly changing its form. So, you are from one body to another body. Once a living being, whether you are human, animal, or celestial being, dies, this being's rebirth is determined by his accumulated good or bad karma. In other words, if you have good karma, you go to the path of reincarnation that is, has a lot of merits. If you have bad karma, you go to paths of reincarnations that would be terrible, that would be vicious, and that would be, have, involve a lot of suffering. There are six paths of reincarnation, of course. When a living being dies, he or she will be reborn in six realms. Human realm, animal realm, heavenly beings realm, hell realm, Azura's realm, and what else? I got five, did I got five or six? Huh? Huh? Hungry ghost, right, yes. Yes. Hungry ghost. So, what determines, what determines where we should go? What determines that, oh, we, we reincarnate into human again, or reincarnate into animal, or, or a heavenly being, or azura, or victims of hell? What determines where would you would go? Let me tell you, not Buddha, not a supernatural being, but it's de determined by you yourself. You did the karma yourself. What you have done before, you created your own hell or heaven. Nothing to do with Buddha. So you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful on your actions, on your speech, on your thought. Then we pause a minute and we say, oh, that's logical. You're responsible. It's simple logic. You're working in a company, you're irresponsible, you slack off, you think you're going to get a promotion, you think the company is going to fare better because of what you have done. If you are irresponsible for your family, you, th you think your kids is going to be highly educated and, and useful citizens to the, to the society, you think if you fool around, you don't care, you'll be successful, it's all logical. You think you don't study and you pass the examination with an A? I'm still looking for that book, <laughs> How to Pass the Examination Without Working Hard. I still am looking for that book. I, I was, when I was a kid, I was dreaming. I, when I was studying, there's so much to study, and I was always had my imagination. As, and, and I said, if there is a book which says, which teaches us how to pass the examination without studying, that's the book I want. That solves all the problem. But I can't find that book. So, that means through reincarnation, all human beings reap the good or evil consequences of their own karma. The quality of their deeds, their speech and thoughts in previous lives determine the circumstances of their rebirth. Now we have just said that karma is caused by deeds, words and thoughts. What are these deeds, words and thoughts? It is important to identify them. I'll give some examples to you. Say, killing, stealing, unchastity are deeds causing karma. Promiscuity, unchastity, fooling around, uh, killing, stealing. Lying, slandering, harsh language, and frivolous talks are words causing karma. Greediness, hatred, and ignorance are thoughts causing karma. Have you got all those? Anyone who haven't got any of those, raise your hand, please. 
No? So you always have certain amount of greediness, hatred, ignorance. You have certain amount of slandering people, talking behind their back, lying, stealing, jealousy, hatred, anxiety. What do you do in business? Did you, by all means, as long as you make money, you don't care other what, what the customers want? Are you cheating? All these things, in the process of craving for and struggling to obtain wealth, reputation, status and power, being continuously bounded by passion of attachment, and also in the process of satisfying your senses, your pleasures, you do all sets of unwholesome things. People are looking for, some people say, in life, as long as I'm happy, that's okay. I want to be happy. And they don't know what is happiness, though. They thought that satisfying my senses is happiness. One of my senses, one of my sense organs, my eyes. Satisfy my eyes. I want to see the prettiest things. Good looking, pretty. As long as what satisfies my eyes sense, I'm happy. So they want to satisfy the eyes, the ears, with music, no criticism, praise. I just like praise. No criticism. Don't criticize me. Don't say anything bad about me. I only want to listen to good stuff. That satisfied me. No advice. Nose, oh, I like perfume. Tongue, the best taste, delicious. Mapo tofu. Sour and spare ribs. The nicest steak, New York sirloin steak. Everything so nice, it satisfies my taste. Taste buds. Silk, clothes, fashions, you name it. All the happiness that the um, beginners were like, they're all geared to satisfying his senses. You think that is happiness? We misjudged, we, we misdefined happiness. Now how to define happiness? I'm sure some people here can define it, happiness. Um, I spent some time already talking about it. So, um, what contribute to karma? What contribute bad karma? Greediness, just to name a few. Greediness, hatred, ignorance, doubt, false view, anger, enmity, concealment, jealousy, parsimony, negligence, fraudulence, shamelessness, love, injury to others, lack of kindness, selfishness, just to name, name a few. Have you got all these things? Are you, were you jealous of people sometimes? Well, do you have anxiety? Do you, um, are you selfish? Are you generous? Or you just want to, to get, you just want to rip people off. You don't want to give out. You always want to receive. You don't want to give. I always like to quote what Kennedy said about a country. Don't ask what you can get from the country. Ask what you, what, what you can give to the country. Don't ask what you can get from your family. What can you give to the family? Your responsibility. Compassion, what are good karmas? Compassion, absence of greediness, absence of hatred, absence of anger and bigotry, repose of mind, generosity, responsibility, chastity, faithfulness, courtesy, benevolence, motivation. All these are creating good karma. Which do you prefer? Who do you like? Do you like people who are performing good karma? Or do you like people who are performing bad karma? You will know, I don't have to tell you, but you just have to be reminded. Or oh, I have to be reminded too. Why are we doing meditation? We're doing meditation because we always want to put our mind in repose, in the peace of mind that we know what we are doing. We sometimes, or most of the time, we don't know what we are doing. That's why you get angry. That's why you get jealous. 
That's, quite, that's why you yell. That's why you get depression. Because you lose control, you lose control of yourself. And Buddhism is to control yourself. Know yourself. Let's not talk about high level profound philosophy of Buddhism. It's very simple. Have you ever been told to control yourself? Yes. My dad always yelled at me like that. John, control yourself. Don't get wrong. Don't get mistakes. But he just told you to control yourself. Did he teach you how to control yourself? Seldom. He's too busy going to work. Mom is too busy looking after the household work. Mom is just yelling at me, say, don't do this, Joan. You get into trouble. Or you get some whipping because of that. They never, or very, uh, so the reason, it's also karma. Why did good kids come out from family, from certain family? Because the parents really spend their time with them. The parents really have meetings with them. How to be good, how to behave. And you now see the danger of broken homes. Kids go astray into the street, no parents. They get into trouble, they become criminals. Why? Nobody tell them what to, what's, what, nobody tell them from the perspective of morality what is good karma and what is bad karma. So if these kids come to Saturday class every, 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 every week, that would be a nice thing. Because you know what is wrong and what is right, what is, what, what is good and what is bad. But it hasn't been... Uh, people, well, people prefer to go to parties. If they tell them, come to a Saturday class, Dharma talk, and you'll learn a lot. What can I learn from them? I better go to parties. White spot, McDonald's, karaoke, Chinese food, and on TV, soap opera, movies. They line up an hour for the movie and two and a half for, for the long movie for four hours, and they won't come here for one hour listening to a Dharma talk. So, to the beginners, the doctrine of karma may seem fundamental, but actually it is subtle and exceedingly intricate. Actually, karma contains the law of causation. You know what causation is? Causality? That is another very important concept in Buddhism. For example, a plant. In a plant, the seed, if we can identify that as the main cause, there's cause, there's effect. The main cause is the seed, and the effect, when it comes to fruition, becomes the fruit, the apple, the fruit. And in between, that is the contributing conditions. So in between cause, that is, there's the main cause, the secondary cause. The secondary cause, we call them conditions, and then the effect. This is the truth of the whole universe. There's cause and effect. We call it causality. It's so scientific, so logical. A good cause directs itself with contributing factors, conditions, nurturing it would get into good apple. Causation. Nothing to do with Buddha's control. Nothing to do with Buddha's blessing. So why do you have to prove strength to the Buddha then? Why do you kneel to the Buddha? The Buddha is the teacher. The teacher who reveals all this mystery to us. The teacher who wants us to look, to, con to, to look inside of us, to find out more about us. Not to find out more about worshipping him. So the quality of your future depends on what you are doing now. You believe it? You can change your destiny. Don't be pessimistic about it. Everything can be changed. First of all, you've got to know yourself first. First of all, you've got to know all this 
that the Buddha told you, karma, causation. So you be careful with your deed, your thought, your action, your speech. It is very logical. If I am a, a, if I'm a graduate fresh out of university and I'm looking for a job, I got my job, and uh, I, I, I read some statistics. Many fresh new graduates from universities, uh, about 50%, well, 50, 40% of them get fired in the first job. You know why? Because they're not careful. They're not careful about their, th their thought, their words, and their action. They thought they were just, they thought they were out of university and they got hired, you know, they got all the chance in the world. And they don't know how to mix with people. They think they can do what they want with no caution. And eventually they get fired. And after flipping a few jobs, they learn the hard way. Why? Because they start to be careful with the way they talk to their boss. They start to be more careful with the way they do their job. They start to be more careful with their attitude. What does that attitude mean? The thought. I always think that we can tie Buddhism to management or Buddhism to job management. If you know yourself, then you perform much better. Buddhism is apply Buddhism, not just talking about it. If we can apply Buddhism to daily life, that would help a lot of people. Don't look at, look at it religiously, spiritually. Buddhism is for the world, not for you after death. Some people say Buddhism is for after death. No. Buddhism is to make you, is to teach you how to experience your life. Being confronted with the vicissitude of life, how do you face it? How do you face the changeability? How do you become more cautious about it? How do you become a better person? How can you become a Buddha without being a better person? I've never seen a person who was wicked and becoming a Buddha. There was a monk who was, who was always wandering from temple to temple, looking for the ideal teacher. There's no such thing as ideal teacher or, or, or ideal temple. So, but this monk was traveling from one, one temple to another and stay in a temple for a few months and oh, I'm not satisfied with this temple and we're going to another temple. Or another temple, I'm not, I couldn't get along with people in there and I would change to another temple. They always, he always wandered from one temple to another in search of the ideal teacher. And one day he came to a village. He passed by a, a cemetery. And he saw a man, and that man ferociously taking a stick, and it, the man was beating a heap of skeletons. Strange, an odd occurrence. That ferocious man enraged, extremely enraged. And he was holding this big stick and he was beating and beating on the heap of skeletons, human skeletons. So the monk asked, this pile of broken skeletons are senseless stuff. Why are you beating it? The furious man said, you don't understand. This pile of skeleton belonged to the body of my previous life. I hated it. There was a monk who had natural, supernatural power and he told me that this skeleton was my previous life's skeleton. I hated it so much. I hated it because when he was alive, this body was doing all kinds of bad things. He was greedy, he was vicious, he was lustful. He was selfish, disloyal and irresponsible. He ill-treated his parents, and he always involved in the acts of killing, slandering, sexual misconduct, and stealing. Because, because of all these bad deeds, I, he reincarnated as I am now. Poor, lonely, sick, and helpless. 
what I'm suffering now is because of all that he had done when he was alive. I hated him. I want to beat him until his all skeletons turn to dust. Strange. The monk thought to himself, this man is foolish. He is beating the skeleton of his previous body. The bad karma that he had accumulated has brought him all his present suffering. He should learn how to repent and cultivate good karma in this life instead of expressing his, his hatred and attaching to his hatred. But on second thought, while well, this man is furious, maybe I shouldn't meddle into his affair in case I got beat up too. So he said, no, I'm not going to meddle in this affair. So his bid is farewell and he continued to walk on. So he walked and walked and he left the village. And one day he came to a forest. He felt tired after walking and he sat down under a, a tree and started to rest, to take a rest. He crossed his lake like this and started to, to meditate. And very soon he entered into a state of tranquility, equanimity. That happened uh, when you were meditating. When you meditate, if you're so involved with it, you have that peace of mind, that repose of reposeful mind that sometimes you just enter into a state of tranquility so quiet so peaceful in his tranquility he suddenly saw a celestial being a heavenly being descending from the sky in his tranquility and he was a man he looked so graceful and so elegant well wow, that gracelessness and, and elegance is not like the elegance that we have uh, a man dressing, you know, a woman or a man elegant. This is something, something very holy, something very spiritual. And, and also the body of this heavenly being is emulating light, light of compassion, light, light that, that makes the whole surrounding blissful and peaceful, radiates some light and fragrance. That's the characteristic of, of heavenly being. And some people call heavenly being guardian angels. Guardian angels, they, they, they emulate light, compassion, light of compassion, you know, a good fragrance. And, and the monk was looking from a distance. That heavenly being landed on not too far away, about a few yards away. And after he landed, he was prostrating to a pile of stuff, paying respect, kneeling down and prostrating to a pile of stuff. And, and, uh, um, and the monk looked very closely at the pile of stuff and he found that it's a heap of skeletons. Same as the thing that he saw before. A heap of skeletons. And, and, and the monk thought to himself, why did the heavenly being go straight to a pile of skeletons? You see, all heavenly beings have the supernatural power to read the mind of others. So that being was able to read the mind of the monk. He knew what the monk was thinking. And he smilingly, smilingly said to the monk, and he said, this skeleton belongs to the body of my previous life. Because of the good deeds that he had done, I have become a heavenly being enjoying happiness and longevity. When he was alive, he was kind and, 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 and compassionate, thoughtful, responsible to his family and, and generous to all his relatives and friends. And, and he abstained from killing, from stealing, from, from sexual misconduct. He abstained from lying, from slandering. And he was a man of virtues. Because of all his virtuous karma, I was born as a heavenly being. I have come to praise him. And now I'm paying respect to him. He make me what I am today. And the monk was all touched. You see the difference? In a few days, just in a number of days, that monk experienced two beings beating pile of skeletons, beating himself. It happened, but they all have different karma. So, this morning, I don't want to go into the profundity and the intricacy of karma. 
Karma, the concept of karma, sounds fundamental and simple, but actually it's so intricate because it involves causation. There's immediate karma, long-term karma, there's group karma, individual karma, there's so many categories of karma. How to identify karma? How to learn from the concept of karma to cultivate good karma? All these we need to talk about. So this morning I'm just giving you a generalization of karma. It is because of karma that we, we reincarnate in the six parts of reincarnations, that we involve with transmigration, that we're involved with samsara. What is samsara? Beginners, you don't know what is samsara? Samsara is birth and rebirth. You have been involved in birth and rebirth for a very, very long time. But you've forgotten about your past. When you get born, you forgot about your past. And remember we addressed the, the, the question? I think Bunny raised that question. How come we couldn't remember the past? If we could remember the past, wouldn't it be much better if we can remember the past? We can learn better. I already have given one hour to explain why we can't remember the past. There are a lot of reasons why we can't remember the past. Can you remember what happened when you were one year old, when you were two year old, when you were three year old, when you were five year old, when you were six year old? You can't even remember when you were a childhood. How can you remember your past life? Simple answer. You can't even remember something that happened a few years ago. How can you remember something that happened to you maybe a hundred years ago? But some people do remember some of this stuff. Why they couldn't remember, I already gave answers, so I'm not going to go through it again. Uh, you check with my video on rebirth. I have a video, now I document it in a video. Uh, that subject on rebirth explain why we can't remember and why some people remember. What happened to some prodigies, music, um, musical prodigies, who without learning piano could play the best jazz piano music. Some genius never learned how to paint and they paint the best picture. They remember, they didn't learn. They didn't learn in this life, they remember from last life. So we know that karma explains why we come to this world. Um, that's good karma, bad karma. A neutral karma. So does it mean that we always have to cultivate good karma? Some people say bad karma is bad. Bad karma has got me to the uh, path of reincarnation of the hell victims, animals, and hungry ghosts. Maybe I should cultivate good karma. If I cultivate good karma, you, if you cultivate good karma, where would you go? After you died, you go to heavenly beings realm. Or somehow you will be the Azuras realm. One of the Azuras. Azuras is demigod. In between the 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 merits is in between humans and heavenly beings. We call them Azuras, another category. Um, or if you cultivate good karma, you'll be humans again. You think it's easy to become a human? One day the Buddha was addressing a congregation and in the middle of talking, the Buddha, maybe he sensed that some people had that question uh, in the group, in the congregation, and suddenly he held up a pile of sand in his hand and he said, those who died and reincarnate into humans again are like the sand in my hand. And those who die and could not reincarnate into humans, but into other vicious rams, it's like the sand on the ground. Can you compare? You have that fortune to come back, you were, you were Jeanette, and you come back as John in this life. You must have done a lot of good karma for you to be able to come back as human again. Not supernatural being that determines where you go. You work out your own karma. 
So you said, okay, then I cultivate good karma and everything will be fine. I will be generous, I will be thoughtful, I will be responsible. Mind you, these are very difficult too. Uh, extremely difficult to cultivate good karma. But then even cultivating good karma is not the final destination for you. Why? Because if you cultivate good karma, you become heavenly beings. You are still in samsara. You have to go beyond good and bad. You have to go beyond all that to attain that nirvana where, where it is not a dualistic discrimination existence. I don't know if you know what I mean. You have to go beyond good and bad. Good is still an attachment. You're being attached. You're attached to good. It's a lot better than attaching to bad, mind you. That's your first lesson in Buddhism. You cultivate good karma. That's a novice lesson. Cultivating good karma, be a good person, is the first step. You have to start somewhere. But after that first step, you have to learn about do I go beyond this? Go beyond good and bad. That's the more profound concept of Buddhism where you really have to learn how to meditate, the dhyana, how to dip in levels, how to be non-dualistic, how to get rid of discrimination, discrimination of your mind, how to get your consciousness exceed the dualistic uh, approach of life.